All right, brother. I think it's fixed. Problem with technology is it doesn't always work. I'd like you to please turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew. We're taking a little break from Acts this morning uh, because I want to speak on the resurrection message, although I could do that from plenty of places in Acts, just not the place that I was at in going through the book of Acts. But I want to begin in verse 62, please, of Matthew 27. Matthew 27, 62. I'm going to read into chapter 28 down to verse 10. Begins this way. Matthew 27, 62, now the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days, I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, he is risen from the dead. Last shall be worse than first. I said to them, you have a watch. Go your way, make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goes before you into Galilee, and there shall you see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet. And worshipped him. And Jesus said unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. And again, God always blesses the reading from his precious word. Um, why Matthew? Uh, it's interesting. I just in my regular readings, I was reading through the Gospel of Matthew. And I was particularly in a fresh way taken with this portion of scripture. And particularly, I guess what impressed me was that the, the, the greatest empire in the world at that day was doing everything it could to make sure the tomb was sealed. And they were powerless to stop the resurrection of Christ. And it's just good to be reminded that as far as God is concerned, the nations... Even Rome in all its might, even America in all its former might, <laughs> is just like a drop in the bucket. Pretty insignificant. I mean, a drop in a bucket is a pretty insignificant thing compared to the power of God. So I want us to be reminded this morning as we consider this of resurrection power greater than the greatest empire that the world had ever seen at that time. And certainly great to affect amazing things, both in our life and in our world. Notice verse 62. It says, and by the way, just a, 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 an aside here, Matthew has details that are absolutely unique in all the accounts of the resurrection. And part of the reason is that he's writing specifically for the Jews, and that among the Jews, there is uh, this kind of idea circular in that the disciples had stolen the body. 
And so he wants to convince you that Jesus is the Messiah. And so he has to show the evidence that that could not have happened, did not happen, that he really was risen. And so you get this section that is not found in the other accounts. It's specifically geared at the Jewish people and especially at this, uh, this nonsense that was being circulated at that time. So verse 62, it says, Now the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together to Pilate. It's kind of interesting. Uh, we know the Lord Jesus rose on the first day of the week. And so the Pharisees who were quick to criticize the disciples because they take ears of grain on the Sabbath day and in their minds, you're working, you're defiling the Sabbath. They had no difficulty doing their dirty work on the Sabbath. <laughs> they go and they see a pilot on that day, which was supposed to be a rest day, but they were doing work. It was evil work. It was scheming work, but they were working. And so it's interesting how, uh, again, the problem with legalism in all of its ugliness is that people always find a way around. <laughs> and uh, if it suits them to get out of it. So it says in verse 63, this is what they said uh, concerning uh, to Pilate. They said, sir, we remember that that deceiver said while he was yet alive after three days i'll rise again so another couple of interesting things here about this particular verse first of all it seems like they remembered better than his own disciples remembered and he had said to them over and over again i'm going to jerusalem i'm going to be handed over to the chief priests and i'm going to be crucified and i'm going to rise again the third day and yet none of the disciples were there that morning expecting him risen they weren't paying much attention, but the enemies were paying a lot of attention. And they said, we, we know this deceiver said. They were aware. <clears throat> Notice, too, that they're affirming he was really dead. Notice what it says. We remember that the deceiver said while he was yet alive. See, you wouldn't say while he was yet alive if he wasn't really dead. Now, why does that matter? Why is that significant? Well, the reason it's significant is this, that one of the theories that people who are unbelievers uh, have tried to spread is that Jesus swooned on the cross. He didn't really die. He, he just kind of fainted. And when he was in the tomb, uh, the cold of the tomb kind of revived him a bit, and, and he was able to... Uh, to somehow get out, and uh, he really didn't die. But his enemies said, no, no, we remember when he was yet alive. He really did die. By the way, it's interesting, in liberal churches, they believe this kind of nonsense. Uh, this is a, an interesting little article I came across. It was from a newspaper, and um, this, uh, <clears throat> this letter to the editor of a, of a, of a Christian magazine, actually, uh, evaluating the swoon theory. It says this, Dear Eutychus, our preacher said on Easter that Jesus just swooned on the cross and that the disciples nursed him back to health. What do you think? Sincerely, bewildered. So here's the response. Dear bewildered, beat your preacher with a cat of nine tails <laughs> with 39 heavy strokes. By the way, it was more than 39 heavy strokes. That was the Jews only did 39 strokes. The Romans had no such uh, inhibition about doing more. He probably had a lot more than 39 strokes. But anyway, just for the sake of our illustration, beat your preacher with a cat of nine tails with 39 heavy strokes, nail him to a cross, hang him in the sun for six hours, run a spear through his heart, embalm him, put him in an airless tomb for 36 hours, and see what happens. Sincerely, <laughs> Eutychus. <laughs> yeah, if you have a preacher that does that kind of thing, you just <laughs> you try that on him, see what happens. Verse 64, it says, commanded therefore that the sepulcher be made sure. Now, I want you to notice, this is what grabbed my attention when I read this, because three times in 64 through 66, it talks about made sure. Command, therefore, the sepulcher be made sure. Verse 65, Pilate said unto them, you have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as you can. Verse 66, so they went and made the sepulcher sure. So there's a tremendous emphasis in these verses on make it sure. And this is, this is interesting, isn't it? The world made it as secure as they could. Amen. But it wasn't enough. 
Amen. Because the power of the risen Christ is greater than all the might of the world. And we need to just get that, be gripped by that. Notice he says, command therefore the sepulchre be made sure till the third day lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people he is risen from the dead so the first the last error shall be worse than the first the last error shall be worse than the first the first error was people believing on him in his life on his claims that he was messiah that was that was bad enough but then uh, the the last error worse than the first is uh, you see he also claimed that he was the son of god and that he would rise from the dead and so if, if he rose from the dead, that would be worse as far as they're concerned. And so they want to make sure that this deceiver does this message doesn't get out. Uh, so they, they want to make sure that he doesn't rise from the dead. And it's interesting. They say that they're concerned about the disciples coming by night and stealing him away. To be honest, I doubt that they really believe the disciples we're going to do that. They had their intelligence sources. And they, they knew the disciples had forsaken him and fled, that they were all cowering in fear. They were all hiding. They were all locked in. They, the disciples did, didn't have neither the courage nor the unity at this stage to pull off anything like this. What they were really concerned about was the power of Jesus. Because don't forget, these guys had seen what Jesus had done. They had seen him raise the dead. They had seen him give sight to the blind. They had seen him cast out demons. They had seen all this stuff. They knew he was powerful. And so they seal it as much as you can because, not because they're scared about the disciples. The disciples were nothing to be scared of at this point. After they got the Holy Spirit, they were something to be scared of. But at this point, they're not anything to be scared of. They're scared witless. But they use that illustration. They say, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people he's risen from the dead. So the last error is worse than the first. Notice, please, verse 65, it says, Pilate said to them, you have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as you can. Make it as sure as you can. Now, <clears throat> this watch it's kind of interesting that it, these soldiers were roman soldiers we, we know that because the very word watch that is used here is a latin word uh, that is comes from from the word custodia or custody and it was it was a exclusively latin word and they wouldn't have had to ask Pilate to put their own gods there what would be the point i mean they, they had the temple gods they could have put them there without any problem they didn't need Pilate's permission no they were they were after maximum security and so the maximum security was a roman guard and that would be four soldiers changing every four hours and these soldiers would be in their full military armor uh, that would include the short sword and it would include the spear and it would include the shield and all the and again remember these are these are crack troops this is this is the elite the roman uh, guard here put a guard make it as secure as you possibly can and it's interesting that in doing all this what they did, actually, they're trying to stop the resurrection, but they actually make the proof of the resurrection even greater by their actions. They don't realize they do, but that's exactly what they're doing. They're going to make it secure as they can. And they're, they're, they're doing everything within their power. So Pilate says, of course, you, you can have a watch. Go your way. Make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. So what have they got here? Sealing the stone, setting the watch. Let me just go through what obstacles had to be overcome for the Lord to be risen. Okay, just that from a, a, a practical standpoint, as far as the, 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 the enemies are concerned, they're setting some obstacles. First of all, there's a material obstacle. There's the stone. Now, the stone was a problem because the stone 
uh, well, it was, there was kind of a, a run where the stone would roll down and it was, it was shaped in a downward motion. So to get it, you got to push this stone uphill out. It's not easy. And it's a very heavy stone. So, so you've got a material obstacle, large set in this inclined channel. It was a definite obstacle for sure. And even if the, the idea of the disciples stealing the stone away, it, you, you just can't imagine them between them working together, especially with a Roman guard there anyway. I mean, there's a little bit of a difficulty. First of all, they've got to get past the Roman guard. Then they've got to move the stone. These are pretty big obstacles. And the Lord from inside, if they're just thinking of him as, you know, swooned or whatever, uh, you know, just kind of coming around, he's not going to do it either in their minds, right? So, so this is a very serious material obstacle. Then there's an obstacle of human authority. You see this seal, he says, <clears throat> make it the sepulchre sure, verse 66, sealing the stone. Now, this seal, it was, it was a rope that was, was attached outside. There was a wax seal, and on that seal was, was the seal of Rome. In other words, it, it, anybody that actually came through that, that rope was defying the authority of Rome. So, it, so it's an obstacle of human authority. It's it's you dare touch that. It's not you know like a crime scene where they have that yellow tape. You know this is this is this is the seal of Rome. This is saying you go through this, you are defying the authority of the Roman Empire in all its might. And so it's a very serious thing. It's a seal. It's an it's an obstacle of human authority. On top of that, there's a guard. There's an obstacle of human strength. Right? So there's material obstacle, there's the human authority, there's human strength. These soldiers with all, and these soldiers, they didn't care anything about Jewish laws or rituals. They, they were securing the tomb, and the only sacred thing as far as they were concerned was that seal. Their loyalty was to Rome, and they would defend that with their lives. And so you can see that there's a lot of obstacles here. But what's amazing to me and what's so thrilling to me is that none of these obstacles worked. Material obstacles don't stand before the resurrected Jesus. Human authority does not stand before the resurrected Jesus. And human strength does not stand before the resurrected Jesus. Oh, how wonderful it is to know the power of the risen Christ. And so quite clearly, they're doing everything they can to make it sure. And then we get into chapter 28, and this is just a delightful section. I want you to notice the language here in, in, in verse, two, verse one of chapter 28. And, and I love the King James rendering here, uh, just in the end of the Sabbath. I think that's, that's beautiful. Some have tried to uh, change that to lay on in the Sabbath and all the rest of it, but let the King James rendering stand. It's eloquent, it's profound, and it's a startling commentary on a change in the national order of things. It's telling us Judaism is finished. Everything about these events are telling us the old order is done. The end of the Sabbath, that's done. The tearing of the, the temple veil from top to bottom is saying that the whole temple system is done. There's a new and living way now that we can enter in through the veil. Uh, that is Christ's body. And then the priest rending his garments is saying it's an end of the old priesthood. What, what we've got here from Matthew to the Jews, it's all done. We're on new ground now. We're, see, the Sabbath was, was the end of the old creation. Now, we don't meet on a Jewish Sabbath. We meet on the first day of the week with the disciples. They, they met to break bread on the first day of the week. Why did they do that? Because they're connected not with the old creation, but with the new creation, connected not with the first man, Adam, but with the risen man, the Lord Jesus, their risen glorious head. And that's why we meet on Sunday, the first day of the week, because the Lord 
came and conquered the grave. Notice too who comes. It says on the, at the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. These were some of the women that had ministered to the Lord Jesus in his life. Luke chapter 8 talks about that they, they provided for him out of their sustenance. And, and now these same women are coming to minister to him in his death. Now, again, they don't believe he's risen. They're not coming for that purpose. They're coming to see the sepulcher. They don't, they don't realize he's alive. And so they, they've come. It's an action of love. But it shows they didn't expect his resurrection. Now, who are these? It's Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, which was the wife of Cleopas, the mother of James the Less. They went to see the sepulcher, and they had no idea of the enormous change that had transpired. That tomb, in many ways, was the grave of all their hopes. See, they believed he was the Messiah. They had followed him. They they'd kind of betted everything on him being the promised messiah and now it just seemed that their dreams and hopes were shattered he was dead as far as they could think but nevertheless out of love for him they came in their minds it contained the mortal remains of the one whose life and love had conquered their hearts they didn't expect to see anything else in their sorrow they came to see the sepulcher, but instead they saw the Savior. Amen. Oh, happy day. Their sadness was turned to joy. And, and it's wonderful, isn't it, just to think of that. You can imagine that no doubt every step was a heavy step as they went towards that sepulcher that day. I don't know how they expected to, it tells us elsewhere, they came with spices to anoint the body. And I don't know how they expected to get in and do all that, but they, they did. But look at verse 2. It says, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. Now, it wasn't the earthquake that caused the removal of the stone from the entrance of the tomb, but the angel who descended from heaven. But such, I believe, the power that he removed that stone, that it actually caused an epicenter tremor that would kind of go out from there and ripple throughout the whole land. And if we could put it this way, it was a foretaste of the power of the resurrection, that this message would ripple out from there to the very ends of the earth, that he is risen. It's interesting, isn't it, that there was an earthquake that marked the death of Christ, Matthew 27, Verse 51, it says, and behold, the veil of the temple is rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. That's when the Lord Jesus cried out and gave up the ghost. So, so there's an earthquake that marks his death. There's an earthquake that marks his resurrection. And what do you suppose is going to happen when he comes back again at his second advent? Zechariah 14 and verse 4 says, when his feet touch the Mount of Olives... It says the mountain's going to split in two. There's going to be another earthquake. It's amazing, isn't it? Just to think of this. The ground shook with palsy when its creator died and shook with pleasure when he rose again. <laughs> I love that. Uh, I, that's not mine. Just in case you think I'm that eloquent, you would be mistaken. <laughs> but I can read, and that's a great advantage. <laughs> the stone was not rolled away to permit Jesus to come out because he had already left. He wasn't there. It was rolled back so people could see for themselves that the tomb was empty. Amen. That's the reason. And again, you just you think of this, all of man's power. And this angel just almost <laughs> just flips it back and sits on it as if it's a say, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> don't you just love the power of god i just i don't know i just think it's absolutely thrilling this angel his countenance it says was like lightning and his raiment white as snow verse three uh, of course <clears throat> he, he's an angel has come from the presence of god and uh, like anybody who's in the presence of god the countenance shines as a result of it and so uh, <clears throat> the angel 
Amazing, isn't it? The angels heralded the incarnation when Christ came down from above. And angels heralded the resurrection when Christ came up from below. Now, again, isn't that amazing? I, I just love how, how, how neat scripture is, how, how it all just fits together. They announced the birth of the Lord Jesus, his, his coming into the world, the wonders of the incarnation, uh, God being made flesh and dwelling amongst us. I mean, amazing to think of it. And the angels announced that. But now he's come back from below and the angels are there to announce it. The resurrection of Christ. And notice these crack soldiers. It says, for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. <laughs> so much for the might of the Roman Empire. So much for human strength in the presence of the divine, of this angelic being who's just come from the presence of God. And they're shaking in their boots, we might say. And they're like dead men. It says, verse 5, the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. Again, stressing that the Lord really died. We, we know that you're seeking Jesus, which was crucified. He was crucified. He did die. Nothing. Uh, there's no question. When he gave up the ghost, he died. The death of Christ is undisputable. He died. And the angel affirms that just as the enemies had affirmed it. We remember when he was yet alive, that deceiver said these things. So he, he died. But then it says in verse six, he is not here. For he is risen, as he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. The empty tomb is the great apologetic of the resurrection. It separates Christianity from all the world's religions, all the world's religious leaders, all the philosophical leaders of this world. I was thinking about Lenin the other day. You can still go and see his body. <laughs> you know, the, the, the man behind the ever so popular socialistic nonsense that is coming into our country. But the leader's dead. But the Lord Jesus is the only one that has an empty tomb, and that the angel invites people to come in and see. He's not here. He is risen. I remember uh, when we were in Israel, and one of the places that I enjoyed most was, was the garden tomb. And what I enjoyed about it was that day we spent in Jerusalem, and I was so sick and tired of religion. Uh, we went to, we went to uh, the place where the Roman Catholics say the Lord Jesus was crucified. And, and I didn't even go in because at that stage I was, I was I, I'm, to me, the smell of the Pope makes me ill. So even going in those places, I just can't handle it. So, so anyway, uh, but apparently they were, they, were, they were in kissing the dirt where he supposedly died, all this kind of stuff. And so we just had religion all day. And then we went to this, this garden tomb. And the, the guy was Swedish, um, guide there at the tomb. And he says, we think this is where Jesus was buried, but it really doesn't matter because he's not here anyway. He is risen. And I just felt so thrilled in my soul. But let's just think about that garden tomb. <clears throat> it's in the shadow of Gordon's Calvary. I, I tend to think that's exactly where the Lord Jesus was buried. Uh, and it's because it's it's in the garden and the garden is in the foot of a place called the skull. And there's old pictures of it before the Muslims built a, a, a cemetery on top of it. And before some of the earth actually collapsed down and it looks just like a skull. I mean, the pictures are just it's so obvious. And so in the shadow of that is this this garden. And in, when you go into the garden tomb, um, <clears throat> it, what's interesting about it is. General Gordon, that's why it's called Gordon's Calvary. Uh, he was the one who discovered it in 1885, as well as the tomb. He did a very wise thing. He took a jar of soil gathered from the floor of the tomb and took it to some chemists to ask if there was any trace of decomposition in the soil. 
And the word came back from the analysis, no trace of decay in that tomb at all. You see, neither did his holy one see corruption. These things are wonderful. The tomb is empty. There's no evidence of corruption in that place at all. And he's alive. And so the, the angel says, he is not here. He is risen. And notice this, as he said. I like that phrase. In other words, it's almost kind of a little bit of a rebuke to these ladies. I mean, they're very loyal. They're coming early. But what he's saying is you should have known he wouldn't be here. Didn't he say to you that he'd rise from the dead? And just look in Matthew's account alone. We, we could look at the other Gospels, but just look at Matthew's account. He said it, and he said it often. Matthew 12, verse 40. Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. It says, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Matthew 16, verse 21. Matthew 16, verse 21, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Chapter 17 and verse 9. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. Verse 23 of the same chapter, chapter 17, and they shall kill him and the third day he shall be raised again and they were in exceeding sorrow. And chapter 26 now in verse 32, 26 verse 32, we read this. It says, but after I am risen again, I will go before you unto Galilee. And so when the angel says he's not here, he is risen, then he just that little kind of barb he throws in there, as he said. Weren't you listening? <laughs> Weren't you paying attention? He said he was going to rise. And he did. And he did rise, just the way he said. And then he says this, verse 7, he says, and go quickly. Now, we just notice this. Go quickly, tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. Behold, he goeth before you to Galilee. There shall you see him. Lo, I have told you. Notice in verse 6, he invites them to come and see. He is not here. He is risen. He said, come see the place where the Lord lay. And then he says in the next verse, go quickly and tell. Come and see and go and tell. That's a great message, isn't it? It's always the divine order to tell others the good news about the Lord. It's not until we get a clear vision of the place where he lay, of his work on the cross, and his resurrection from the grave, do we have a message to go and tell? First he says, come and see, and then he says, go and tell. Come and see, go and tell. The women, it's interesting, they got the privilege of bearing the biggest news story ever to break in history. I mean, we think we get big news stories. They're not big. This is the biggest news story in history. He's risen from the dead. And they go and tell, tell this message. And, and how the, they took it seriously, didn't they? And we've been going through the book of Acts. What were they preaching about all the time? Yeah, he died. He was buried and he rose. And they were telling that message to everyone. We've come and seen. Now we got to go and tell. Are we going to go and tell others about the fact that Jesus has conquered death, that he's alive? That he's coming again. Are we going to tell them these messages? This is important. Come and see. Go and tell. Verse 8, it says, and they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy. Imagine the mixed emotions. Fear and great joy. They're going to see the Lord. He told them that you're going to see him. And, and so on one hand, there's great joy. We're going to see him again. Well, that's a wonderful thing. But fear. Why didn't we pay attention? <laughs> Why were we not listening to what he said? And, and again, just these are just awesome things. They're amazing things. And so it says, go and see. There you'll see him. And they departed with fear and great joy. Did run to bring his disciples' word. Notice that. They ran. 
Their, their feet are swift. I was preaching on Romans 3 the other night about man and his feet swift to shed blood. And yet now God has taken those feet that were once shift, swift to shed blood and he calls them beautiful feet. And we need to be swift to take the message of life, not death, but life through the Lord Jesus. And so the Lord meets them and it says, as they went to tell his disciples, verse 9, behold, Jesus met them saying, all hail. I like this, all hail. It literally has the idea of rejoice. Uh, the, the Greek word, it has, it's lovely, the descriptions of it, calmly happy. Jesus tells them to be calmly happy. Or another way you could put it is be well. Uh, rejoice. Be joyful. And so he says to them, all hail. A lovely greeting of, of joy. Be joyful. And then he says, it says they came and held him by the feet. That's very important, isn't it? It says they held him by the feet and worshipped him. Well, it's two things. First of all, they held him by the feet. That means that he wasn't a spirit because you couldn't get old of a spirit because it's a spirit. It, it wasn't that uh, he lived on in the memories of his followers. They literally held his feet. Because he has a real body, not a spirit being. He is a, the eternal spirit, but, he, but, he, but he's got a real body. And again, it's important for us to know that. Jesus' resurrection, the same body that went in the grave came out. Now, there's some magnificent changes. <laughs> he can walk through walls. He can do all kinds of things. But he still has that body. And that body is now at the Father's right hand. There's a man in the glory at our father's right hand on our behalf. It's a wonderful thing. And so <clears throat> they're holding him by the feet was proof of, of an actual physical body. And then it says they worshipped him. Now, again, we know from elsewhere in scripture, if he was anything less than God, he would have been horrified. Remember when Peter's worshipped, he says, get up, I'm just a man. Don't, don't you dare do that. When, when, what we just saw recently in Acts where, where Paul um, and, and Barnabas were worshipped and they tore their clothes. I mean, they were horrified at the thought. And even an angel in Revelation, uh, uh, John attempts to worship the angel and he says, I don't, don't you dare worship God. And so the very fact that the risen Lord Jesus accepts these women's worship without pushing them away and saying, don't do that, is very evidence that he is who we always claim to be, the eternal son of God who ever lived in the bosom of the father, the word that was, was with God, the word that was God. He indeed is God blessed forever. Amen. He is God manifest in flesh. He is exactly who he claimed to be. And so they held him by the feet and worshiped him. Then said Jesus to them, be not afraid. And this is lovely, isn't it? Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee. There they shall see me. He didn't say, go tell these wimps, these bunch of cowards that ran away and left me at the cross. He didn't say, you know, go and tell those people that didn't believe me, you know, when I said I'd rise. No, no, he says, go and tell my brethren. Isn't that beautiful? D despite all their failures and all their shortcomings, He's not ashamed to call them brethren. And the same with us. We're, we've got lots of shortcomings, don't we? Every one of us. And yet he says, I'm not ashamed to call you brethren. Go tell my brethren. So why is the resurrection that five minutes so important? I want to just go through some, some important points that, that just to summarize the importance of the resurrection of Jesus. It proves that Jesus is the son of God. You see, they said this deceiver. And one of the things they thought he was being so deceptive about, he had the audacity to say that God was his father. And they, were, they thought that was blasphemy. And yet the resurrection was evidence of his claims that he was who he said. And in fact, he said, destroy this temple in three days. I will raise it up. Proof of what authority had to do the things he did. He was indeed the son of God. It proves that he is the son of God. 
it verifies the truth of scripture even the old testament scriptures we even talked about one today uh, you will not suffer his holy one to see corruption uh, that was a uh, certainly david saw corruption who wrote that psalm but the descendant of david the lord jesus did not see corruption and, and so again it t testifies to the truth of scripture it assures our future resurrection because he rose we know we're going to rise one day. The dead in Christ shall rise first. And then those that are alive will be caught up to meet the Lord. Day. And so his resurrection, you know, it's the first fruits. It's the guarantee of a greater harvest because he rose, we're going to rise. And so it's a, it's a, it assures our future resurrection. One day we will be risen like him and see him. It's the proof of future judgment. I want you to see this. Look at Acts 17 and verse 31. Acts 17 verse 31 this is a very important scripture and we'll get to it again as we go through acts but x 17 31 because he had appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained whereof he hath given assurance to all men in that he hath raised him from the dead you see he kept saying uh in John's gospel, that the father had given all judgment to the son. But if the son was dead, how can he judge anybody? But he's alive. And his resurrection is proof that he's going to be the judge of the living and the dead. He's going to judge all men. It's a proof of future judgment. It's the basis of Christ's heavenly priesthood. We've been thinking about that this morning in Hebrews. He lives in the power of an endless life. And that's why he's so different from the Old Testament priest. Because if you got an Old Testament priest you liked, the problem was that he died. And then you could get another guy after him who could be an absolute dud. You know, like, like Hophni and Phineas, you know, or something like it could be terrible. But we have a high priest and we like him. We really like him. He's a wonderful high priest. And he's never going to cease to be our high priest Amen. that's wonderful it also assures our future inheritance because we our inheritance is laid up for us in heaven and how are we going to get there to get it well we're going to rise and everything that he has done will be assured to us and then just finally on the first day of the week that resurrection day it tells us in Acts 20, verse 7, that the disciples did something to show they understood that there'd been a massive change of things. They didn't meet on the Jewish Sabbath, but on the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread. And they're testifying, we are now remembering a risen man. We are now connected with a man who died, but is risen again. And that's where we are. Our, we're, our connection is with a risen head the lord jesus and so the resurrection is a marvelous marvelous picture of the power of god and we can live scripture says our lives in resurrection power the power that overcame every obstacle we can live in that resurrection power you see, when we get baptized, we say, what, what are we saying? We died with him. We we're buried with him. We rose with him to a new life, resurrection life. And that resurrection life is able to come, overcome every obstacle the world throws at it. Do we believe in resurrection power? Oh, it's wonderful. They made it as sure as they could. <laughs> But it wasn't sure enough because they couldn't keep him in. He's alive. He's not here. He is risen as he said. May God encourage us with the marvelous truth, which is the cornerstone of our faith. I mean, if, if Christ didn't rise, our faith is in vain. It's all worthless. But he's alive. And God encourage us with these thoughts. Let's pray. Father, we just pray that uh, we will, having come and seen, we'll go and tell. And that we'll do it not fearing human authorities or human strength 
are human obstacles, but we'll go in dependence on the risen Christ to share this glad, glad tidings that yes, he died. Yes, he was buried, but as he said he would, he rose again victorious and he is alive today, changing lives today, bringing resurrection life to people who were once dead in trespasses and sins. Help us to share this glorious message with others. We ask it that he truly would be magnified, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.